Uh, by the end of today, I will make sure that everything is uploaded to YouTube. I was a little bit behind and grading. I'll make sure to get that. And then on top of that, I will also make sure to uh, change all the deadlines, like I said I would. Um, there were office hours yesterday. Uh, I realized after class ended, Alex texted me, said he could hold some, and then I think it got pushed back to 7.45 or 8 o'clock. So um, by, by next week, by Monday, we'll have a solidified routine schedule for office hours. So that way it's just not like hit or miss. So you know uh, exactly what times and also the different Zoom links. So yesterday was his Zoom link office hours. Uh, I know a few of you showed up to mine. I was going to try and talk to you guys, but I was taking my midterm while you showed up. So I couldn't, but yeah. So keep a lookout. Probably I'll try and announce it on B courses. If not, then Monday next time that we meet, uh, I will make sure that that is uh, concrete and solidified. We'll try for three to four days a week. So that way you can ask questions just about every single day. Uh, with that being said, so there are... So today, let's talk about what we're going to go over today. Am I recording? Yes, I am. Okay. So, so far, we have... Whiteboard's coming up here. <sighs> nope, not Monday. Tuesday. So Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Today is Friday. Four days. Okay. Tuesday was just review, right? Wednesday, we covered sections 1.1 and 1.2. Thursday, we covered sections 1.3 and 1.4. So that was yesterday. So both Wednesday and Thursday have been uploaded to YouTube. Oh, well, they will be uploaded to YouTube. They're recorded. Uh, Tuesday was just your basic factoring review, unit circle, sine, cosine graphs. Today, we're going to go into 1.5, and then we're going to jump right into section 2.1. So 1.5 and 2.1. Um, we're going to try and, like I said, we're going to try and get all the way up to section 3.9, okay? But we're not going to do all the sections from each chapter, just the ones that are required for Math 1A. So I'll have a detailed list for that. So that way, if you want to read the sections and follow along, you can. But uh, yeah, today we're going to go over sections 1.5 and 2.1. On Monday, we are going to go over 2.2 and 2.3. So next Monday, okay, we're going to go over 2.2 through 2.3. So this weekend, if you want to get ahead, read those sections. So that way you can come into class already kind of knowing what the material is going to be. You can go ahead and read sections 2.2 through 2.3. That's what we're going to cover on Monday. Um, let me clear this. So today, we're going to jump right into... Two points, or sorry, 1.5. Before I start, are there any major questions from the homework that didn't make sense or anything that I can go over really quickly since I know some people weren't able to make to office hours? Uh, and again, I'll try and get you that feedback directly by commenting on your homework problems as I get to grading them. Confused on 4B, okay. Let me see if I can give a brief explanation on 4B. 4B from, oh, 1.4 from 4B, it, from 1.4, I'm assuming? Yes. Awesome, okay. I'm gonna try and go through this uh, quickly, but not super fast, okay. Uh, yeah, good question. So, um, all right, let's go ahead and rewrite this as, this is the square root. I'm gonna use capital letters, uh, so no one gets confused. Square root of A times the square root of square root of B. Okay, all over AB. To the one third power. Okay, I'm just going to rewrite this as A to the one third B to the one third in the denominator. Okay. See how I did that and then I'm just going to focus on the top here square root of A times the square root of B. Okay, so all I did was just uh, simplify the denominator a little bit, made it look a little less complicated. Um, now let's go ahead and just rewrite this B, right? I'm gonna rewrite this B as B to the one half. B 
to the one half, just like so. So now this is the square root of a times b to the one half, okay? I can rewrite this whole expression as a times b to the one half to the one half power, right? So now this one half goes into a and b individually, right? So I can rewrite this again as a to the one half. So if I multiply or if I raise that power inside, we get a to the one half and this becomes b to the one half times one half, which is b to the one fourth. Hopefully you can see how I got there. Any questions? Well, can you stay there for a bit so then uh, copy it down? Yeah, okay, sorry. <laughs> sorry, yeah, it's also recorded too. So if, uh, if I go too fast for anything, right? Uh, I was talking about this yesterday. One, it's because we have two sections a day to like cover. So I wanna give us enough time to do that. But also too, uh, sometimes I can just write super fast. So no worries there. Uh, yeah, I'll give you guys a second to copy that down. But I'm trying to uh, I'm trying to explain it in a methodical way, so that you can go back, right? Look at it and be like, oh, okay, I kind of understand what he was explaining, and then retry it and see, oh, okay, I see how this works. But if you can understand how to get to this point, right? It was just rearranging, manipulating the equation. I think probably the hardest part is just recognizing. Well, okay, this is just one of our rules right here. I think this is like rule number two or rule number three from our notes yesterday. Uh, even though we didn't see that example in uh, uh, our notes yesterday, right? And this right here, I think the hardest part is just recognizing that this b is inside, the, the square root of b is inside that other square root, right? So just rewriting that as a times the square root of b or b to the one half, right? All to the one half power, right? Just rewriting it like that. So I think that's probably the hardest part of this equation. Then it, it all checks out, right? We get to something that looks like this, a to the one half divided by a to the one third, okay? We can rewrite that as a to the one half minus one third, right? Because we're dealing with fractions. So we subtract them. So a to the one half minus one third, common, uh, common multiples. This is three sixths minus two sixths, which is just a to the one sixth. So that stays in the top here. And that is multiplied by b to the one fourth minus one third, so I believe that would give us uh, 3 twelfths minus 4 twelfths, if I'm not mistaken, right? D uh, hopefully you can see. So this is b to the 1 fourth minus 1 third. And that, okay, that checks out. So that gives us b to the, uh, yeah, 3 twelfths minus 4 twelfths, which is minus 1 twelfth, okay? So this is times b to the negative one twelfth here, right? So I just I just worked on each term separately, right? But they're still multiplied by each other, and we have this negative exponent here. So I'm just going to rewrite it in the denominator like so. This is b to the one twelfth. Can someone confirm or deny that that is similar, if not what they got for part b of problem four? Yeah, I got that. Okay, awesome. So that is how it simplifies down just like that. So look at your rules. Uh, hopefully that wasn't too challenging, but now it should be a little bit clearer. Um, for part A, hopefully the example that I showed you yesterday, uh, you were able to simplify that X to 3N minus 1. And number 19, find the domain of each function. I, I gave you that one. I, I thought that was a pretty good... Uh, I thought that was a pretty good example. So hopefully we're able to do that. But yeah, here's the other thing too. I know that uh, can someone please send the link for the class book. Yeah, if someone could send that link again, that'd be great. Yeah, question, go for it real quick. Um, how do you decide which one goes on, on top and which one goes on bottom, you know? How do I decide which one goes on top and which one goes on bottom? Yeah, because you put, um, I don't know how you did it, uh, you subtracted like one half from one Correct. third and then you know, one fourth from one third um, right. as well. Yeah, yeah. So let me, you let me show you the largest one. Yeah, let me let me show you how I did that real fast. So here is here is the process behind that. So if we had an X divided by X squared, right? We know that we're left with one over X. 
how did we get there? Okay, there's a one, there's an invisible one, right? We just don't write it. This becomes x to the one minus two, right? We rewrite it as that, okay? Which, which gets, you know, simplified down to x to the minus one, right? So with that same logic, okay, we can rewrite negative x, or we can write uh, variables to the negative exponent as one, right? Think of it as like a ticket, like an elevator sort of, right? one over x now to the positive one power okay with that same logic okay we did that exact same process we took term we just went term by term right so i said a to the one half minus one third one half minus one third is positive one sixth so a to the one sixth is left over but it's positive so it stays in the top it stays in the numerator okay now we looked at term b right it's multiplied by term a uh we said one we said this is the same as saying one fourth minus one third right b to the one fourth minus one third this is that's rewritten as when you figure out your fractions b to the minus one twelfth right because we have that b to the minus one twelfth okay that minus one twelfth gets carried into the denominator so it becomes b to the positive one twelfth right and that's how this becomes in the denominator right there hopefully that answers your question so if not no worries. okay uh, yeah, I have to move on because it's 925. So yeah, quick review there. Perfect. Let's jump right into section 1.5 today. I will try and uh, be brief with this section and only teach you exactly what you need to know or stuff that is super important. So is this function one to one? Horizontal line test. A function is one to one if and only if no horizontal line intersects its graph more than once. Page 56 of the textbook, not sure what page it would be in your PDF. Okay. <laughs> Someone wants to shoot that on the chat. Perfect. So basically, all this is saying uh, one to one, right? Terminology here. A function is called one to one if and only if you have, let's say, f of x1, right? Does not equal f of x2. In other words, okay, if we look at a graph like this, okay, um, here, I'll draw it in green here. Let's say it, it, it looks something like this. Our graph comes up and then down, right, goes on forever. Uh, if a horizontal line intersects the graph of f in more than one point, then we see from figure two that there are numbers x1 and x2. Uh, this means that this graph is not one to one. In other words, this is called the horizontal line test, okay. If you draw a horizontal line across your graph and it intersects two points, in other words, you see how those two points represent the same y value, okay? Then this function is not one to one. Not one, two, one, okay? That's just terminology, right? Let me give you another example, right? So horizontal line test, if it hits two points and they equal the exact same, then the function is not one to one. If you do the horizontal line test and there's only one value, okay, the function is one to one. Now, let me give you another example, okay? Let's draw a graph, okay? Y equals X, the, the graph Y equals X. Let's draw our horizontal line, horizontal line test, right? Because that's what we do to figure out the, if the function is one to one. Is this function one to one, yes or no? Type in the chat or say yes or no. <laughs> Yeah, thumbs up. Yeah, right. Pretty straightforward. There's only one point right here. Okay, that's it. That's the horizontal line test. That's the uh, that's the one to one test. Right. It's one to one. Right. It is one to one. Think of it that way. If there are more than if there's more than one point, <laughs> then oh sorry, there's a raised hand. Go for it. What's the question? Wait, I thought it was the vertical line test. Like if yeah. there were two points on top of each other. Yeah, there is. So. There's, so I'll get to that in just a second, right? So the vertical line test, right? So th that's just the horizontal line test to test if a function is one-to-one. -one. The vertical line test, what you're talking about, right? Let's let's look at a graph this way, okay? Well, x squared plus y squared equals, what do I mean by one-to-one? -one? Okay, that's just terminology. That's just a definition. All I mean by one-to-one -one is this. Okay, let's graph. This is the graph y equals x. Oops, that is no graph. This is the graph y equals x right here, right? Passes through the origin, 
it's just a straight positive line with a slope of one, right? Y equals X, you've seen that graph before, okay? Now let's graph, let's graph negative, let's graph negative X squared. In other words, uh, or let's graph a similar function to that, okay? So I'm just gonna graph it something that looks like this, okay? It's like a upside down parabola, okay? So two different graphs. All I mean by one-to-one -one is this, okay? If we draw, if we draw a vertical line, okay? If we draw a vertical line uh, like this, or sorry, not a vertical line, I apologize, a horizontal line. If we draw a horizontal line, okay? If this graph crosses the same Y value at two different points, the function is not one-to-one. -one. What I mean by that is there are, there, there are more than one X value that give you the same Y value. Do you see that? This is like, let's say X equals two, and this is at X equals seven, right? And they both give us the Y value of let's hypothetically say four, right? Y equals four when X equals two and seven. Therefore, the function is not one to one. That's all I mean by that. Now, if we look at the graph Y equals X, we can see it only ever crosses the graph of y equals x once. In other words, if it crosses the, the horizontal line, if you draw a horizontal line, right? You just draw a line. If it, cro if it crosses that graph just one time, it's called one-to-one. -one. That's, all, that's all that terminology means. Hopefully that clears it up. No, that makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. That, just one-to-one, -one. that's all it is. I mean, it's just terminology. So if you can just remember, if it only touches once, it's one to one. If there, if it touches the graph more than once, it's not one to one. That's all it means. Okay, uh, it's good to understand that though, because when you get into calculus and what I'm about to explain here, that'll get better. The vertical line test. Let's talk about that vertical line test for just a second. Okay, I want to look at the graph of x squared plus y squared equals four. Okay. <sighs> A circle, thank you, yes. So I believe it's at the origin here. Forgive me if I'm wrong. It's a circle, right? So the vertical line test basically says this. Draw a vertical line, right? If you draw a vertical line, like so, I'm just going to draw a vertical line. This is the vertical line test. If, if it crosses if, if it hits more than, if there's more than one point for every, for every X value, in other words, if we have X equals zero, right? We get Y equals positive two and Y equals negative two. Hopefully everyone can see that, right? Because of this square here, X equals zero, this term goes to zero. Y squared equals four, square root of four is plus or minus two, right? y equals plus or minus two, okay? This is technically not a function. This is not a traditional function. So we call it the vertical line test, right? I did, I chose the circle graph because everyone knows, well, hopefully you've seen x squared plus y squared equals four. Uh, I have a question real quick, go for it. Or is that an old question? Okay, no worries. Um, that's all, so yeah. Uh, if, if the now vertical line test, right? Horizontal line test, we said, all right, if it crosses more than one point, right? If, if it crosses, if there's more than one point that it touches, it's not one-to-one. -one. Vertical line test, if it hits more than one point, in other words, if there's two or more, it is not considered a function. It's not considered a traditional function. Uh, let me see if I can clean that up a little bit more. We have a graph like this, okay? Let's say our graph looks something like this, like an inverted parabola, uh, flipped. Technically, this function does not exist. Okay, so you can graph this. There's there's certain functions, but the vertical line test basically tells us draw a line. Oh no, we see more than two points. Okay, this is not a traditional function. That's all you have to know. Okay. Uh, with that being said, nine thirty three. Okay, what else should I teach you? What do you need to know? Okay, one to one. That's all you need to know. All right, quick example f of x equals x cubed. Is this function one to one? Is it one to one? Okay. This is one of our questions. All right, we're going to graph it out. Zero comma zero, one comma one, negative one comma one. Okay. It does something like this. <laughs> I believe that is the graph. 
if that looks wrong, correct me. Is this function one to one? Yeah. Yeah, right. It's it's one to one, right? We draw at any point. You can draw your horizontal line anywhere, right? But as you can see, I'm drawing all these horizontal lines, and the, at no point will it ever give me. You see what I mean? More than one value. So yeah, this function is one to one. Okay. What about f of x equals x squared? Is this graph one to one? Before I even draw it, hopefully you guys. Nope. Can, right. Yeah. Hopefully you guys can see. Right. It's not going to be one to one. Why? f of x equals x squared. Draw a line through it. Okay. Now I have another question for you. Okay. What if we have f of x equals x squared, but we are con we are contained to the bounds of zero comma infinity open or closed because we can't reach infinity. So it looks something like this, right? We're given bounds. Now is this function one to one? Yes or no? Yes. Perfect. Isn't this Everyone's to, like loop back or something? All right, or say no. that again. No, because it tells me it's like um, resistivity loops back or something. I don't remember. Yeah, so uh, we basically draw our horizontal line, right? Based on the bounds, right, we start at zero and we go to infinity. So we no longer care about this left side, right? Because that's not included in our bounds. So when we're drawing our graph, right, this is now one to one. That's all. Cool. Sounds like everyone's on the same page. I'll move. I'll move on from the horizontal line test. Just keep that in the back of your head. Uh, a and range B. Then the inverse function f of negative one to negative B and range A is defined as. Okay, inverse functions. Okay. F of x, or yeah, let's say f of x equals x squared. To find the inverse, right? f to the negative one, okay? Now don't get confused, this doesn't mean denominator, this means inverse, okay? So this notation right here, this is the same as saying inverse. Inverse, like so. f of negative one of x, okay, is equal to... Uh, Here's something I found on the web. Alexa, shut up. <laughs> Sorry, I'm mean to my Alexa. I don't know why she just started talking. Oh, well. Um, <laughs> that was so mean. I'm sorry. Uh, it's only because she wakes me up in the morning with my alarms. And so obviously I'm not the, uh, I'm not a morning person. <laughs> yeah. Okay. See, all right. I'm not. All right. Cool. All right. Everyone's, I'm, I'm not going to say the word. Okay. The A word. I don't want to, I don't want to upset anyone else's, uh, <laughs> should we call it a personal assistant? Sure. <laughs> Oh, that's funny. Okay. Ah, back to math. All right. That was funny. Um, yeah. The inverse, right, is just we're basically taking it and we're now flipping the x and y's. Okay. Equals x. This is the same thing as saying uh, f of x. So this is the just the notation. But basically, when we're talking about inverses, we're basically just saying you swap your x's and y's. And now you're probably just like, okay, what are you talking about? Look at this graph right here. We have f of x equals x squared. We can rewrite this as y equals x squared, okay? The inverse, the inverse of this, I'll write it in red. The inverse of y equals x squared is x equals y squared. Do you see how I literally, okay, y equals, now I just flip-flopped the x and the y's, okay? They literally, that's just the inverse, right? Think of it this way, we're flipping them. Cool, just wanted to make sure in case people are like, what are you doing? That's it, you just take, Wherever your X is and your Y, you switch them, okay? So now we solve for Y. So we solve for Y, we just take the square root of both sides and we're left with Y is equal to the square root of X. Does everyone see that? Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, another thing to know about the inverses uh, of functions, let F be one one with domain A and B, okay going to go on here. Okay. If we have f of x, right, with domain is equal to a and range is equal to b. All right. So let's say our domain was all real numbers and our range was from zero to five or from zero to infinity. Okay. Then the inverse of x, okay, 
f to the negative one of x, or I guess I in notation, I wrote it as y. Okay, the inverse of x. I, would you guys rather me just write the notation in terms of x so you kind of understand that it's talking about the same graph? I think that would kind of help. It really mm -hmm. does. Okay, yeah, but we'll just go with that, okay? So inverse x, right? And you know, you just flip-flop inverse x. Sorry, that looks terrible. Um, the domain is now equal to b and the range is now equal to a. Does everyone see that? So basically your domain and range now switch, right? And it makes sense because we're switching the x and y. So our domain and range switch along with that, yes? Okay, the only thing, the only, only thing, our domain and range. Our domain and range, actually, no, it still checks out, okay? Y equals the square root of X, right? That is the inverse. Uh, what do we know about the domain? It has to be greater than zero, right? We technically can't take the square root of a negative number, right? What's the square root of negative one? Nothing. Technically, it's imaginary numbers, but for calculus, we don't even deal with imaginary numbers until you get to theoretical and quantum realm, which doesn't even, it doesn't even make sense anymore. So don't even worry about it, okay? So this means that our domain, right? The domain for this graph is X has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? Yeah, laminar numbers. So the domain is X, so B is equal to X has to be greater than or equal to zero, okay? Well, if we look at our Y equals X squared graph, okay? Y equals X squared, our range, right? Our range, is equal to uh, zero, right? Because we'll never get a negative number from the squared, right? Is from zero to infinity. So does everyone see how that checks out, right? In other words, our domain, oops, our domain for this graph, our B is X has to be greater than or equal to zero, right? And our range is basically telling us the same thing. See that? So our range and our domains flip when we take the inverse. Just wanted to point that out. Cool. Let's move on. Uh, covered that. The domain is the range. The range is the domain. Cool. Um, check that out. Let's see here. What do I want to explain next? Is this all under the same unit? Yeah, this is all just section 1.5. So if you're a little bit confused or if you want like, you know, a little bit more detailed explanation, you can go ahead and check out 1.5. They go over numerous examples. I'm just teaching you uh, the basics to just kind of help you get going and the stuff that is just most important, like understanding the domain and range flip-flop. Let's talk about log functions real quick. Uh, logarithmic functions. Um, B to the Y, okay, let's, let's call it this. B to the Y, sorry, make that capital B. B to the Y equals X, right? We can rewrite this using our log, right? This is log base B, log base B of X is equal to Y, right? So this is equivalent to that, right? So basically, if you remember from trig or if you remember from precalc, that's how we rewrite. That's how we rewrite expressions like this into log form, right? So with that, if you were to take the inverse, uh, let's see, do I want to go over that? Uh, sure. So. If we were to take the inverse, this would now become, sorry, I just don't know if I want to teach that notation because it looks a little confusing. Should I do it anyways? Yeah, all right, I'll go for it. So that, if we have log, so, all right, actually, let me, let me go back here real quick. So if we have, uh, let me erase these lines, cool. So if we were to take the inverse of this, okay, this now becomes uh, we switch our X and Y's, right? So we now get log B of Y, okay, is equal to X, right? And we want to solve for Y. Well, we now just rewrite our expression like so. So this becomes B of X, B to the X is equal to 
y, right? Does everyone see? So if we were taking the inverse of this, sorry, I'll draw a line there, okay? If this was our original equation, we just swap our x's and y's. So that's how I got b to the x is equal to y. Sorry, that's a y, not an x. There we go. That's b to the x equals y. With that same logic, this now becomes log base b to the y is equal to x. And that's how you would find the inverse or flip flop the terms. So I believe, yes, that is how you would do that. So pretty, I mean, pretty straightforward working with logs, nothing crazy there. Uh, we went over the log properties already, so I don't think I'm going to go over it. The only other thing, right? So uh, log, I'll write them again really quick. Log a, b, a times b is equivalent to log of a plus log of b, right? We've seen this. I went over it yesterday. I'll just refresh everyone because you're going to need them. All right. Uh, a over b, a over b of log or log of this, right, is rewritten as log of A. These are just properties that you've hopefully seen before, minus log of B. And we have log of, uh, let's call it A to the X, where X is a number, right, like an exponent. We can rewrite this as X times log of a right so if we have coefficient coefficient multiplied out front right let's say this was like two let's say this was two times log of a we can rewrite this as log of a squared that's all you need to know <clears throat> uh and i'll write this log of base e so log of base e of x we rewrite this as ln of x natural log. That's all. That's all you really need to know. Um, oh, one more thing. Ln of E, right? Remember those cancel out. That equals one, not zero, just one. All right. Um, if you want, you can, you can uh, use what I just explained to you and you can solve for the Ln of E to see that it actually comes out to one. It's perfect. Uh, oh, change base formula. Let's go over that really quick. Oops. Let me clear this all. How are we doing on time? 947. Okay, I'll walk. I'll go a little bit quicker. If we don't get to all of 2.5 today, that's okay. I'll try my best. When we get to derivatives, I really want to give you a concrete foundation uh, or limits. So I'll try my best to uh, save some time for that. Change of base formula real quick. Log of uh, b to the x. Uh, yeah. yeah. Log base b of x. That's equal to ln of x over ln of b. You're like, what does that mean? I'll give you a quick example. So with that example, let's just say we have log of eight, uh, log of base eight of five, right? that is equal to ln of five divided by ln of eight, right? Based off of this rule that we applied up here, right? So if you get a base that's other than 10, normally if you just see log of five, okay? Log of five, this is a good point. If you just see log of five, technically, okay? <clears throat> the base, right? We just, we just assume it's 10, okay? So just assume that it's 10. So when you just see log of five, you're like, what's the base? If there is no base, we assume the base is 10. That's a really good point. Anyways, uh, based on this rule right here, if the base is not 10, we just simply write it out as log of base eight of five, which is equal to ln of five divided by ln of eight, which gives us approximately 0 0.77. This is just plugging into a calculator, three, nine, yada, 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 all right. So I just wanted to make that clear in case you, uh, in case uh, things weren't checking out. Um, other than that, okay, section 1.5, there's a lot of stuff here. Sines and cosines stuff. Do I want to kill you with sine and cosine? Probably not, but will I do it anyways? Most likely. <laughs> Kidding. Um, all right, let's check this out real quick. 
We have sine of x, right? Our basic sine of x graph. Y equals sine of x, or in this case, you know, f of x. Okay, take the inverse of it, right? Well, first off, what's our domain? Domain is all real numbers, right? Our range is from negative one to one, right? Now we take the inverse, okay? So F inverse, oops, I'll write it down here. F inverse is equal to X equals sine of Y. Solve for Y, we get sine inverse, right? Inverse sine of x equals y. So our domain now becomes from negative one to one and our range is from, or our range is all real numbers, right? Because these two switch, what does this mean? That means our domain is contained from negative one to one. How do we get negative one to one? Well, that's, uh, yeah, oh, no, that's fine from negative one to one, that's it, okay? That's how we would deal with sine and cosine graphs, pretty straightforward. Uh, if you want me to graph that, I can graph that, yes, I can. That would give us something like, like this, okay? Now, right, see, see how it oscillates, but it goes this way. Question, does this pass the vertical line test? No. 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 Right, so you can see how the the original sine graph looks something like this. Sorry, it got cut off down here. Okay, the original sine graph looks something like this, right? The inverse now you can see is that blue graph. See that? Pretend pretend that they're both at the origin, right? Does this pass the vertical line test? No, it does not. Does it pass the horizontal line test? The the inverse. Does the blue graph pass the horizontal line test? Yes. Does the red does the red graph? No, it does not, right? So yeah, someone said it in the chat, right? This pass, this is one to one, this is not one to one. Okay, so just keep in mind they'll ask you questions like that. Okay, that is all I wanted to go over. Okay, just keep those in the back of your head. Let's give you a problem. Um, so just be super straightforward and simple um, for num for section one point five. I'll give you the homework now for section 1.5. For 1.5, I want you to do problem. Uh, okay, problem number one. I mean, that's really easy, super easy. It should take you no more than like 30 seconds. And let's try problem number, let's do uh, numbers one and number 26. And for good practice, yeah, numbers one and 26. It's the weekend. I won't kill you. All right, numbers one and 26. That's all I want you to do from section 1.5. How, how are we doing on time? 8, 15, 10, 8, 10, 18, 19, 20, 21, 23 minutes. Okay. I don't know why that was so difficult for me. Probably because my brain is tired from my midterm yesterday. I was up until like 1.30 in the morning. Not taking the test, just decompressing and then also grading some homework last night. All right. Section two limits and derivatives. This is where it counts. All that other stuff. Yes, that's important. But this is the heart of calculus that we are getting into. Uh, someone remember those numbers. I think it was one in 26. I'll write it down just because I know I won't. Okay. So section 2.1 tangent and velocity problems. All right. So I'm just going to try and I'm going to try and explain conceptually uh, for those of you who have never seen this before, if you have seen it before, bear with me, but I'm going to try and just explain this from a conceptual standpoint. All right. Let's say we have a graph. We have our graph y equals x squared, right? Oops. Let me draw our axis. Pretend that those two graphs touch at zero. Okay y equals x squared, right? Pretty straightforward, we've seen it before. Um, is, any, is everyone familiar with the term tangent? Does everyone know what the word tangent means? Does anyone not know what the word tangent means? Let's, let's start there, tangent. Does anyone not know what this word means? Just say Can no. Can you explain it for the recording? 
yeah perfect um no yeah i'm, I'm just I, I i was gonna get there i was just making sure okay all tangent means is yes. this okay we have this graph okay theoretically speaking let's say we were to zoom in right if we were to zoom in um well first let me explain it this way how do we find the slope of a regular graph let's say we have the graph let's say we have y equals x squared right this is the line or sorry y equals x this is y equals x right here okay how do we find the slope of this right it's just rise over run in other words we we take our rise over run right this is our change in y right i'll call it delta y this is our change in x right so you can see how we take two points we take two points and we get and and we find a value and that gives us our slope right well guess what if i wanted to get a more precise definition yes this is a line so it's going to give us the same thing right but what if I made these two point? Ooh, oh my gosh! No. What if I made these two points closer? In other words, now you see how that red triangle is a little bit smaller. It's a little bit closer, right? So now this is our delta y. This is our change in x, right? And now we're getting closer and closer. Okay. What happens if I draw? Oh my gosh! Forgive me. I'm going to try and make this even smaller. What happens if I try and make this even smaller? See that? See how I'm getting smaller and smaller and smaller? The points are getting closer together, right? As, as I'm making it more precise, those points are getting closer and closer together, okay? Well, the tangent line, okay? The tangent line is basically that singular point, right? As we're getting closer and closer together, right? That tangent, that the tangent line to any graph is just that singular point and we can draw, that's called the tangent, right? The tangent is the line that passes through that singular point. So in this case, right? I'm now going to redraw that as a singular point. So imagine, oh no, imagine that we just, we made that so infinitely small that it just closes down to one singular point. Hopefully everyone can see that, okay? Then you can see the tangent, the tangent line to that point is literally just y equals x, right? So that's, that's the plain case. That's what a tangent line represents. Now let's apply that to our graph of y equals x squared, okay? Um, let's say we were to focus in on this area right let's say i wanted to find the slope of this line okay well you would say all right well that's approximately let's look at let's let's pick two points boom okay we can see the triangle does something like that right okay nice can we get a more approximate uh we, can we get a more can we get a more approximate slope yes we can right now let's draw it in yellow here now let's pick two new points let's say boom oops let's now say we pick that point right there and that point right there even smaller. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Pretend I can draw that triangle. Hey, look at that. Okay. It worked. <laughs> I'm drawing with my finger. I didn't think that was going to work. Okay. Now, can you see how we get a more precise slope, right? Well, using that same logic. Okay. It's collapsing. It's collapsing. It's collapsing. Boom. Now it's just one singular point. Okay. So we can say, right now, let's just pick our point. I'll write it in red here. Boom, it collapses down to that point in red, okay? The tangent line is the line that passes through that point and that point only. Forgive me, pretend it it, it, it doesn't cross that. There. So can, <clears throat> can everyone see how it passes through that one singular point, right? Hypothetically speaking, and it, it only passes through that one point, there's no two points, right? Because now it just collapses down to that one point. So the line just passes through that one point. Yes, question. Um, isn't it like um, it, it's, it's tangent if it touches that, that point, but does not like uh, go through it, you know? Yeah, you can think of it that way. In other words, it, it touches, right? It touches, but it doesn't go through it, right? Uh, in other words, we've been working with two points. The line goes through both of them, right? when it collapses to a singular point, right? If you were able to get a, like a microscope and zoom infinitesimally all the way in, right? You would see that it like, it, it basically touches that line, but it does not, it like, it doesn't cross it because if it were to cross it, theoretically speaking, well, you know, people fight back and forth about this, right? Then it would pass like two lines, but yeah, it basically represents the slope. Exactly, that's what I was getting to. So it represents the slope of that line right? It represents the slope at that point in the function, right? So in other words, we had the graph y equals x squared, right? And we said, oh, when it gets down to that singular point, 
the slope is just the line, right? But in this case, right, you can see how now that line is at that point, all right? Now, with that being said, okay, let's, oops, I don't want to do that. Now, let's look at the, now, let's pick another point, right? Let's say we were to look at this point right here, right? Let's say this is x is equal to negative 1, okay? So this would be the point uh, negative 1, comma 1 up here, okay? What is the slope at negative 1, comma 1? Well, we just keep doing that approximation, right? We keep doing that approximation. So we see that, you know, we can get closer, 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 right? I'm drawing those smaller, smaller triangles till we get all the way down to that one point. We draw the tangent line that passes right through it, right? Uh, and we can see, I'm going to draw it in green here, okay? We can see if I can draw that just precisely. Oh, no, that's a racer. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Uh, like so. Pretend those two don't overlap and it, they just cross that point. All right. Does everyone see how the green graph loosely represents touching the point negative 1, comma 1, right? Question. Who can tell me right off the bat what is the is the slope positive or negative at negative one? Yes, question, go for it, Diego. The slope would be negative, but the double derivative would be positive. Right, so um, yes, all right, I have a few people raising their hands. Uh, someone else who asked a question, go for it. Okay. If you don't have any questions, no worries. Yeah, so basically we can see, right, the slope of this is negative, right? So we can see how tangent lines give us a really, really good approximation uh, at, at a given point for the slope, right? That's all it is, that's all it's saying, right? And so let's say, let's say now, let's say we wanna look at this point right here, okay? This little green point, okay? I'm gonna draw my tangent line through it. Oh no, that is, horrible tangent line. Boom, something like that. All right, I have a question. Okay. This is that's the green point. Okay, this is the red point up here where that tangent line is. Um, I have a question. Is the green is the is at the point green? Okay, which one's steeper at the green point or at the red point? Just feel free to say it in the chat green or red, red, right? Red is steeper. We can we can visually see that the red line is steeper. What is that telling us? That's telling us that this tangent line approximation, right? That's telling us the slope. Now, if we were to look at our x squared graph, okay, I'm going to delete this for just a second, right? Let's look at those two points, right? We can see, right? Imagine this was a physical slide, right? Imagine this was a slide, okay? You're at your favorite water park. Boom. That's the end. Oh my God. That's like a 90 degree drop. Um, you walk all the way up, right? Here are some steps. No, it's a ladder. You know what? You're climbing up a ladder. You're going down a water slide, right? We can see that green point right here, okay? And we can see the red point is up here, right? We know, okay, this is gonna drop us much faster, right? Yes, our speed's gonna be going faster down at the very end, right? But we can see that it is so much steeper, right? That's why it's terrifying when you're going on those scary like water slides because you're all the way up at the top and it looks like a vertical drop. You're like, oh my gosh, right? But at the bottom, right, It's it starts to even out and then eventually becomes flat, all right? And we could literally physically see that with these tangent line approximations, right? The slope at that point is much steeper than the slope at this green point, right? And hopefully you can see that. Hopefully my uh, explanations made sense, right? But we can see this red line is much steeper than the green line. So that tells us these tangent line approximations, right? They give us a really, really good, accurate description of the slope at a given individual point. This is very fundamental. This is a very fundamental concept. Hopefully you can understand it. Um, yeah, so that is what I wanted to cover. Uh, well, there's more, so much more, but if you can understand that logic and that thought process, right? How we basically all, uh, um, let me go to a new screen here. Cause I don't want to delete that. Cause I might reference it. Uh, I'm going to go here. I'm just going to erase all this. Right. So basically the way we found that just to recap, right. We're given a line. Okay. Two points. That's how we normally find the slope, right? Rise over run. I said, all right, Let's get closer and closer, right? Rise over run, rise over run, okay? Till we get to one singular point, that's the tangent line, right? In the case of the x squared graph, right? 
we said, all right, let's look at, I'll, I'll do an enlarged view, right? We said, all right, we picked two points, boom. All right, that, that gives us a somewhat good slope, right? That, that gives us a line that goes like this. Can we get that even more precise? Yes, we can, right? Pick two new points, right? Boom and boom, right? There we go. Oh, okay, I can see. All right, it's getting a little bit closer. Now, what if I just pick one singular point, draw a tangent line through it? Oh, okay, that's like exactly the slope at that point. Just to recap, hopefully that makes sense. I'll keep going. How are we doing on time? Sorry, 10.04, okay, five more minutes. Let's see if I can, uh, Let's see if I can um, do something here. Ooh, 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 okay. So I just explained conceptually, let's see if I can give you a graphical numerical uh, approach. Let's see, let's see, I'm trying to look at one of the graphs here. Drains from the bottom of the tank in half an hour. The values in the table shown. Volume of V. Uh, if P is pulling. Oh, okay. So that's tangent line. Let's talk about secant lines. Okay. Secant lines. Okay. Secant lines are the opposite. In other words, the tangent line crosses through at one point. The secant line is simply this. Let's draw our x squared graph again, right? Remember how we said, all right, pick two points, draw a line through both of those, right? Hopefully you can imagine that's a straight line, right? We draw a line through both of those and that gives us an approximate, that gives us an approximate slope, right? If we were to pick just one singular point, this would be the tangent line. You can see it's a little bit more precise similar but a little bit more precise okay so the red is equal to tangent okay that's your tangent line and the green is equal to secant okay all secant means okay secant means that it goes through two points to get an approximation and red just means that it goes through one point wait so clarify secant means two points tangent one point correct in other words yeah secant line right passes through two points it's an approximation that gives us an approximate slope the red line is one singular point right and the way that we got to our our red graph the way that we got to the tangent line right is our secant points became became closer and closer together right like i was explaining so they're moving up the, this one's moving up the top one's moving down right and they're collapsing into one point, kind of like a black hole, right? If you if you want to think about black holes like that, a singularity, right? It, it collapses into one singular point. Draw a line through it, that's our tangent line. So you can see, all right, let's say, you know, hypothetically, oh, okay, this is a slope of, let's say this is a slope of maybe like two. Oh, and the red graph we can see that's a slope of maybe 2.5, right? So it gives us, they're, they're close, but the red one is just, precise, super precise. Green is somewhat precise. Okay. With that being said, I know I didn't give you any uh, numerical explanations. I'm looking at number one. Um, let's see if you point on the graph with t equals five. All right. Yeah. So from 2.1, I just want you to try number one. I'm going to go ahead and erase this. From 2.1, I want you to try number one. Okay just number one from 2.1, okay? That is pretty straightforward. I know it's a word problem. We all hate word problems. Unfortunately, they're gonna be with us the rest of our lives. Uh, but for 2.1, try number one. Um, and so, all right, so you should have a total of four problems this weekend. So go ahead, read back through sections 2.1 so you get a better understanding, okay? Also try number one, uh, just two things. Number A, so it, it, gives, you, it gives you a box right? With values, right? You have T and you have V in gallons. Okay. Uh, go ahead and graph them out. Okay. Graph them out. So 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. Okay. 5, 10. I'm setting up the problem for you. 5. Oh gosh. 5, 10, 15. Oh no. Uh, 5, 10. Oh my gosh. I did it again. 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, 
30, right? Set it up. Oh no, I don't want to do that. Okay, pretend that's 30. I know there's a three there. Oh, you know what? Okay, I will try my best to collapse this screen from now on. Um, when you're going back, I see people are looking at the YouTube stuff. I realized that when I have my full, uh, uh, like, like the person bar on Zoom, it records it. So it blocks, I don't know if some of you were able to see that, right? It blocks the, uh, some of the numbers when I'm working at the bottom, right? I will try my best from now on to remember not to have that block. Anyways, yeah, set up the problem like so. Uh, now plug in your values. This is like, oh gosh, we're starting in like the 600s. Uh, then we go down to the 400s, 250. Uh, this is like 111. Uh, this is 28 and zero. Okay, so I'm just gonna approximately draw this graph, right? It does something like this. Okay, that's what the graph looks like. Okay, part A, if P is at the point 15 comma 250, so let's just pretend it's like right there. All right, that's the point P. Um, on the graph of V, find the slopes of the secant lines PQ when Q is the point on the graph with T equals 5, 10, 20, and 15, 15 and 30. All right, so it's telling you, all right, find the secant lines when, uh, find the slopes of the secant line, right? In other words, you have T equals 5 at T equals 5, right? So this point and this point, okay? You draw your line through it, right? Here's one more thing I should say. Hopefully this is all review. It wants you to find the slope of that line. How do you find the slope of that line? Okay, I want you to remember one thing. Okay, point slope formula. Okay, y two or y minus y one is equal to m times x minus x one or x naught. Right? Does that look familiar to everyone? Did I write that down correctly? I hope so. Okay. Y minus Y1 equals M times X minus X1, okay? So how do you do that? We're solving for M, all right? Do we have our two X points? Yes, we do, right? We have, we have our Y1, Y minus Y1, X minus X1. I think I did that right, right? That's how you would solve this problem. Use that point slope formula. Um, or is there one other one that I'm thinking of? I believe that's right. No, or you could just do this. It's as simple as this. Delta Y, Please right? You can, yeah, go for it. No, so isn't it like um, Y minus Y1 and then over X minus X1 or something? Yeah, yeah. So that's where I was getting at, right? Or you could just do, right? Remember how we talked about earlier, Delta Y over Delta X, okay? You could use the point slope formula. That could get a little bit uh, nuanced. So you could do Delta Y over Delta X, which is Y2 minus Y1 over x2 minus x1 and that will give you the slope of this line okay so remember this formula y2 minus y1 equals x2 minus or over x2 minus x1 delta y delta x you're going to be given a x y value for the first point you're going to be given an x y value for the second point that's how you do part a part b um estimate the slope of the tangent line at p by averaging the slopes of the two secant lines okay you add the slopes together right slope one plus slope two, divide by two. That's how you solve part B. Sound good? Um, right, that's just the average. That's how you find the average. One plus two, or the slope of the first one and the second one, not one plus two, right? Um, and then part C, use a graph of the function to estimate the slope of the tangent line at P. Yeah, all right, that's how you do number one. So I basically just you know set up the problem for you. Trying to see that uh, other than that, how are we doing on time? 10, 13. All right. Three minutes over. Not good. Yeah. I know people got to head out here. Uh, thank you so much for staying this whole time. So again, to recap, I believe from sections 1.5, what numbers were they again? Uh, one in 26, I believe. One in 26. From section 2.1, we're just doing problem number one. Cool. Three problems this weekend. <clears throat> Have a nice weekend. Uh, I will try my best to stay in communication. What are the page numbers? So for 2.1, this is page uh, 82 in your textbook. And for 1.5, uh, let's say that is pages 68, page 68 through 69 of the textbook, not the PDF. All right, yeah, go ahead and check those out. Uh, I'll be here for a few minutes for people that have questions. I'm gonna stop the recording now.